is a good story. I came to Nebraska from Liberia, West Africa. After my master's degree, I had always wanted to go to Africa. And uh, my then husband and I found, uh, we applied for the Peace Corps, got accepted, and were slated to go to Ethiopia when the political situation there was such that they evacuated all their volunteers. So we were looking for a place to go, and we went then to West Africa, stayed there nearly three years, and met Peace Corps friends who were from Nebraska. And when we left the Peace Corps, we followed them and came to Nebraska for what we thought would be a year. Well, I, yes, I had a lot to learn coming from big cities in the east to Nebraska. And when I first came here, I found it flat, um, fairly uncreative looking city, a, a grid for the streets, and no striking buildings, not a lot of activity at night. But I've, you know, I realized there, there was much that I had to learn about life in the Midwest. And uh, the subtleties of Nebraska really started to interest me. I, I, I spent some time at the university, but then when I eventually took the job at Doan College, I drove, I still do, on the country roads to Crete. And now I find them beautiful. I love the horizon. I love the fairly rolling blue stem valley. And uh, as far as meeting people in, in Nebraska, I've been very, very lucky to meet some of the most extraordinary people ever. And um, I can elaborate on some of those uh, names. I, the first person I met, other than my friends, obviously, that we came to join, was Paul Olson. And he was working on a government grant and education projects. And he hired me as a freelance writer and editor. And he's been a major influence in my life, mentor, friend. And, um, and I became acquainted with other members of the English department, wonderful people, June Levine, uh, and uh, the Narvisons, uh, Bud Narvison, um, and so many really fine teachers, George Wolf. And then uh, I began a doctoral program and knew more and more people, uh, my own colleagues as graduate students. But then I was uh, chair of the graduate student committee. And uh, so people, new, new professors were hired. And so I was there when Barbara D. Bernard came and Fran Kay, Maureen Honey, Hortense Spillers, so many wonderful teachers and who eventually became friends, Joy Ritchie. Uh, so I've been very lucky with the people that I've met. But I wasn't the kind of kid who, who thought she wanted to be a writer. I loved to read, always loved to read. Spent a lot of time in libraries, worked at the famous Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore. And even all the way through college, I worked in the bookmobiles and, and had work study in the library. But I, I never really thought of myself as a writer. And of course, many of my friends are writers. And here I am assigning books for, for people like Jerry Shapiro and Marley Swick and Judy Slater and Jane Goodall. I just signed a book for Jane Goodall yesterday. I've done all kinds of writing. Uh, as a student, of course, scholarly writing. In my travels, I kept journals. And, uh, and uh, once I became a professor, I started publishing articles and, and uh, papers. And during my travels with students, I kept elaborate travel journals. But I really actually wouldn't have called myself a writer until this very book. Um, because although I've published, uh, I've never had my own personal work published. So this is pretty exciting. The traveling with students, I knew from the beginning of the long semesters that I had to write about this. This was the first time I felt the compulsion. and. Um, and so I began documenting those experiences and thinking of how I might write those. And, and that started in 98. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't until I had a sabbatical leave fairly recently in 2003 and four that I was able to have the time to write. But I knew that I had to write, that I knew people had to read it. Well, I, I wrote, yeah, I, I, I 
woke up in the morning, had my coffee and granola, and started writing. And I wrote for about five or six hours every day. This is, we're talking about writing this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked hard, and I, and I wanted to. I felt interested every morning to, I mean, some days were hard, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I really was motivated. I knew I had that time, and during the school year, I have no time to, to write. I think, yes, I mean, I think I was imagining my students reading the book and their parents and families and, and others. I mean, the general reader, I really thought about what people might want to know mm -hmm. about traveling with students and studying with students in such a, such a construct, a field course. And so I was always imagining the reader. Well, of course, I want to relive the adventure as I write, but I think that people follow the adventures, but they realize how much students learn. I mean, I think, and then, of course, as a reader, you, f you follow the learning and the adventures. And, and so I think I wanted to convey that amazing feeling of gratification that I had as a teacher and the students had, and that learning community that we, that evolved. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I felt that that would be the, the, the good story. Reading a good story is always fun. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write a good story, but I think that, uh, there, I hope that, that there's also a great uh, appreciation for this kind of networking in the world. Well, I think writing is, is can be, it's a difficult, it's difficult. It's, it's very hard to write. A lot of people write a lot. <laughs> Some people will never write an unassigned word, not a grocery list, only assignments. But um, once you feel as if you're getting your thoughts and ideas on paper and someone else appreciates that, it's, it's a very rewarding feeling. And so I think if, I would encourage people to write and to share their writing. And if their writing is going, is communicating to another person, and then I would say that I would encourage them to keep, to keep working and to find a subject, as I say, that really means something. I think that's important. So much of writing that's done in <clears throat> college or university is uh, disconnected from our real lives. And I think student writers don't find much value. They're doing it for a grade. And uh, I think of what Flannery O'Connor said. She said that the university, about, about writing in the university, she said the university encourages too many students to write. <laughs> there are too many of you writing. But I think the problem is that people don't write about subjects that are dear to them or personal. And, uh, and so they don't find a voice. Mm -hmm. they, and they're taught not to use I. Mm -hmm. they're, they're taught to use some formal voice, mm -hmm. the authorial voice, the, the, uh, even, even the passive voice. It was thought that. It was understood that mm -hmm. instead of I felt, I saw. And uh, so I, I, I think, while it's difficult, if students want to write, that's, that's the first step. I'd love to write more travel literature, more travel memoir. And uh, of course, I need another sabbatical. <laughs> and uh, I have this idea, and it would be an enormous challenge, to write about my family. I grew up in a three-family kibbutz, a, th a three-family uh, creation in Baltimore. And uh, so it would be really a, f a, f a, f a history of three families. And so it would be a lot of research on the period. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but it's a great story, and I would love to tell it. Good evening. Thanks for coming this evening. Um, my name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the Ames Reading Series. And we're pretty excited that this series has been around for more than 20 years. And in fact, this is the 168th reading. So that's Betty. <laughs> 
thanks for being here. Um, I also wanted to remind you that Five City TV does film the Ames Reading programs. And if you're interested in the schedule, you can go to the city website and you can click on Five City TV. And they do do a, a daily schedule and you can check for Ames Levitoff in about a month, I would say. It takes them a little while to edit the programs, but um, that's, that's how you do that. They also provide us with DVD copies to check out. And I just brought a little sampling here this evening of the programs from earlier this year. So you can actually come to Bennett Martin and check out a copy if you don't like the schedule, the, the TV. Because they do show them in the middle of the night and in the morning and in the afternoon and also. Anyway, just wanted you to know that as well. We're here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, which is a special collection. There are about 13,000 volumes. In fact, I was told a couple of months ago that it was 12,904 titles, and I always kind of like that. It's a few more now, I think, because that was a couple months ago. Um, but we also have other things. We have the artwork that's on the walls and um, files and manuscripts and those kinds of things, too. So we'd be glad to have you come back at another time when the live, when the uh, Heritage Room is open, which is 12 to 3 on Tuesday through Friday, and Sunday afternoons from 2 to 5. So that would be a time that you could come in and join us again. Thank you. Um, we'd also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. We're able to bring you special programs like these because of an endowment that was established through their volunteer efforts over the years. Tonight our reader is Betty Levitoff. Betty's a professor of African Studies and, America, uh, and English and African Literature at Doan College in Crete. In 1998, she developed the Doan College Semester in Africa, a full term of study and travel. And since then, I believe she's taken some 65 students to Africa. And she wrote a book about the experience, Africa on Six Wheels, a semester on safari. And she um, had that published very recently by the University of Nebraska Press. And we're happy to have Betty here with us this evening. If you'd please help me welcome her, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here and see so many students and friends. I'm excited. The uh, flyer announcing this reading has me titled uh, Professor and Writer. I've been a professor for a very long time now, 24 years at Doan College and seven years at the University of Nebraska, and before that, nearly three years in West Africa. But the writer title is a new one. <laughs> and um, although I've published before essays and articles, this is really my first book pretty exciting, and I'm learning what writers can do, aside from giving readings. Just last Saturday, I traded a book for a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, before I talk about my own work, I have to mention uh, Jane Goodall, who spoke at Doan yesterday. And she is an amazing woman. Some of you are there and heard her speak. So inspiring for all the uh, work she does as, as by herself and for all the ways she networks. And if we ever thought, you and I ever thought, that the world's problems were too overwhelming and complex to do anything, her Roots and Shoots organizations are so uh, amazing. Uh, she said there were 9,000 organizations in more than 90 countries doing all kinds of things uh, to address local issues in environment and animal protection and uh, uh, social issues. And so I just hope that our work in Africa is a small, a small way as part of that whole networking process. That is, people worlds apart or people in the same area making connections and learning from each other and maybe solving some problems. Well, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how the semester began. Uh, Meredith mentioned a few things. But Doan College has had in place for many years, long before I came, an interterm, which is a three-week session between semesters. And 
January and or in May. And there are classes that are on campus and also travel classes. I led the first one in 1986. I took my son and daughter, who were then 12 and 17, to France, Holland, Belgium, and Germany. And, uh, and then I took an interterm to Italy and a few to Greece, and one in 96 to Kenya and Egypt. And these were so exhilarating. The students were excited, and so much learning happened that I began to think about an extended period of learning. I knew that I, what I wanted to do was develop something that any student at Doan could afford. And so I designed a, a backpacker budget, a, a shoestring budget, that would approximate what a student would spend on campus, say, for room and board. And I also knew for Doan to approve the course, it couldn't cost the college very much. And so I designed this full semester of studies with 12 or 13 or 14 credits of classes that I would teach in conjunction with cons consultants and uh, uh, informants in Africa and presented it to the academic dean, my division chair, my department chair, who said, try it as a pilot. And that's what I did in 98. And it was successful, so much so that in 2002, the full faculty accepted the Africa program. And I took the second semester uh, in Africa. And that's primarily what this book concerns. And um, in 2000, 2003 and 2004, I was granted a sabbatical leave, which gave me the time to write the book. Uh, subsequently, I've taken a semester in, two, uh, uh, an interterm in 2005 and uh, to Africa, one to India in 2006, and I just came back this past January from the third semester in Africa. And um, so uh, uh, what I'd really like to do uh, for the reading, I won't do this, I promise, but what I'd like to do is read the acknowledgments, especially the names of all the students. Uh, I'll probably cry now. <laughs> who went with me, because there would be no Africa semester without the students. I won't read all the names, but I am going to ask all the students who've been with me to Africa, and Carla Stormberg, my assistant, would you all just stand up, and I'm going to applaud you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And R Ruby can hold up her little doll from Namibia, too. <laughs> I thought I'd skip around. Uh, Starting with chapter five, we've, this is 2002. We've been in Africa about three weeks. And when I say we, this is a group of 13 students, Carla, my assistant, myself. And we finally made contact after weeks of travail and indecision and waiting for Gavin Melgard, our Australian driver, and his six-wheeler. And that's the six wheels in the title. Uh, to, to connect with us, and that's a long story that you'll have to read about in the book. But uh, we finally connect, and we, we come to Kenya, to Nairobi. So the title of this chapter is Nairobi. Eli's mother said she just read the book, and she was glad that she let Eli go to Africa before she read the book. <laughs> the streets of downtown Nairobi are nearly empty on Sunday. Shops and markets are closed and the avenues are cleared out enough of people and vehicles that we can actually see buildings and learn the main streets. The contrasts are dramatic. The modern Hilton Hotel with huge entryway and uniform doormen is a few blocks from River Road, the Matatu or minibus hub and center of cheap transport. On weekends, the noise level is soccer stadium loud. Matatu drivers and assistants shout destinations while passengers push in all directions to find their vehicles and blaring horns provide accompaniment. Among the passengers and drivers are the ubiquitous vendors with trays of mandazi or donuts, cookies, oranges, or bananas, flats of bread, or variety store inventory and makeshift stalls. In another direction stands the famous Stanley Hotel, once the destination hotel for British royalty, writers, celebrities, as evidenced in the lobby photographs of Edward Prince of Wales, Ernest Hemingway, Ava Gardner, Clark Gable, and Dennis Finch Hatton. It's been renovated several times since it was first built in 1902, when Nairobi was a convenient halfway station on the Mombasa to Uganda Railway. 
A thorn tree, once famous for its message board, now in its third replacement, grows in the center of the cafe and still holds notices, letters, solicitations for riders, and announcements of travel gear for sale. But nowadays, both the tree and the message board are more symbolic than functional since travelers log on to the electronic thorn tree, a link on the Lonely Planet webpage for up to the minute listings. I identify the Thorn Tree Cafe at the Stanley as a good central meeting place. Carla marks it for the best bathroom in Nairobi and also a good place to buy the International Herald Tribune. I buy a paper on that first Sunday and the same paper seller finds me on the streets every day thereafter. I'm not particularly visible. There are many Wazungu or Europeans or white people in Swahili. There are many Wazungu milling around the Stanley but his are the sharpened skills of someone for whom every sale is absolutely vital. The rooftop balcony of Primetime Safari, where we make arrangements for our trip into the Maasai Mara, overlooks Moy Avenue in the densely populated areas to the south, where we are warned we must never go. We can see the crowded, dilapidated houses and street debris. Walking around the city center the first day, the students are shocked by the conditions of the buildings and streets, the filth, and the trash. The people on the streets stare at us, a band of wide-eyed wazungu in twos and threes, without visible purpose, such as market bags or parcels. We must appear to be a strange species of albino, mysteriously dropped on Kenyatta Avenue. I'm at the end of our column with Gavin when I hear a scream and commotion in the front. Two Kenyan kids race off in opposite directions. Malia is crying and screaming. They took my cross. Mike and Sonia are trying to calm her. Luke tells me the two boys walked up to them and one broke free the silver chain around Malia's neck. It's a gift from her mother and one that she never takes off. I had told everyone not to wear jewelry or carry backpacks in the city. But from this point on, nothing changes Malia's hatred and fear of Nairobi. Others of the group, especially those who dislike large cities anywhere, agree. I imagine Malia's shock and feel sorry. But I think if this is all that gets stolen, we'll be lucky. In the afternoon, I plan two excursions that I think will change the mood from the morning experience. 30 minutes out of the city is a town of Karen, a town of Karen <coughs> named for Karen Blixen, Isak Denison. Best known for her book, Out of Africa, a memoir of her years in Kenya, 1914 to 1931. Since no one had seen it, I showed the American adaptation of Out of Africa with Meryl Streep and Robert Redford in one of our pre-departure classes. We take a tour of the farm and see lots of movie memorabilia, Streep's safari boots and jodfers in the bedroom, the famous typewriter, Dennis's phonograph. On a previous tour, I learned that another farmhouse was used for the interior shots in the movie since the rooms in the original were too dark for filming. This house, now a museum, was given to Kenya by the Danish government. We see the Isak Denison family in photos, images of the writer herself while she lived in Africa, Dennis Fitch Hatton, Broer Blixen, as well as later photos of the writer when the ravages of syphilis are visible. The grounds, framed by the famous Ngong Hills in the distance, remind me of the famous first line in the memoir. And Sonia, on the same wavelength, imitates Streep imitating Denison's Danish English. I won't ask her to do it now. <laughs> but I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Ngong Hills. Sonia nails the accent, and we beg her for performances for the next three months. Karen Kenya is also the location of the Nyumbani Children of God Orphanage, a clinic, school, and residence supported by the Catholic Church for HIV-positive children whose parents have died of AIDS. I first visited Nyumbani in 2001 during a six-week planning trip to East Africa at the invitation of two Americans from Denver doing their medical residencies at the orphanage clinic. Visitors are always welcome, and when the Vazungu whale pulls into the parking lot, Sister Teresa greets us and leads us to the playground. Immediately, the 84 kids in residence swarm us, and we each acquire one or more hanging or clinging children. TJ puts a little boy on his shoulders while Two or more, to, while two more attach themselves to his legs. 
Luke, Mike, Sean, and Jason lift kids to their shoulders. Sonia and Carla stand at opposite sides of a teeter-totter. Nicole attempts to take photos while kids are hanging from her. Gavin, who has one on his shoulders, holds the child's legs with one hand and his tripod and camera with the other. And for more than an hour, we play. Sister Teresa gives me a tour of the residences. There are five small houses, each with a mother. In each are beds, shelves, books, toys, a table for eating, a sink. The shared bathrooms and showers are in another building. When we pry the kids loose with the help of the nuns, the resident nurse and manager, Protus, walks us through the clinic, describing the equipment and the examination routines. I walk behind the school to the vegetable garden. Adjacent is the cemetery with 30 or 40 graves. Small mounds of dirt identify, the, the dark dirt identify the newer burials. The older ones are grass covered. Each has a small wooden cross with the heartbreaking facts. Rest in peace, James Ali, born December 15th, 91, died July 22nd, 02. Samson Kimu, born January 23rd, 1991, died May 16th, 2000. Sister Teresa says the deaths are fewer lately. We've lost only one child since spring, she says. Pointing to the playground, she says, these kids are the lucky ones, the few of so many afflicted who are able to get in. Only one of the 84 has a parent, <clears throat> but they get their schooling, their food, and their meds. I think about the hundreds, no, thousands of unlucky ones. She tells me that volunteers, international medical students doing residencies, and untrained workers from all over the world re receive free room and board. Misha takes a quick poll of our group and we decide to donate some of our Doan College student government funds to Nyumbani. Carla goes into the office with Sister Teresa to give our donation and each of us signs the guest book. It's hard to describe the impact of this visit. As Mike says in the van after we leave the orphanage, Africa is a lot of things. TJ's birthday shifts our focus from the day in the city and the excursions to Karen. At dinner in the hostel restaurant, Gavin, Jill, and Misha surprise him with a fabulous cake. They somehow found and bought a cake, frosting makings, and candles. With a pot and a spoon in Gavin's tiny room, they mixed pink frosting and created Happy Birthday TJ with M&Ms. We sing, and TJ is floored, pronouncing the cake awesome. Their faces spotted with powdered sugar, M Misha, Jill, and Gavin grin like kindergartners. The celebration moves on to Nairobi's highly touted nightclub scene, and nobody protests my insistence on taxis. I decide to skip the nightclubs for a rare opportunity to be alone and catch up on my journal. Tucked in my bunk bed, I turn back to the last few journal entries from Arusha and read about Sean's bicycle accident 10 days before. I feel shaken all up all over again, though Sean is fine. When the parents and friends at home imagine dangers in Africa, they usually think of guerrilla warfare in the streets or terrorist bombs. But actually, accidents are more frightening, since political instability can usually be anticipated and avoided. Accidents happen all the time, and there's no emergency rescue, no 911, no ambulance or helicopters. Writing in my journal, I imagine the Doan College administrative officers sitting around a meeting table with furrowed brows. Their images appear to me frequently throughout the semester in black robes like the Supreme Court justices. When the students are bungee jumping from the Victoria Falls Bridge, or we are sandboarding on the Namibian dunes, I think, what if Pappy Corey, Vice President for Financial <laughs> Affairs, what if Pappy could see us now? Naturally, President Brown, Dean Franklin, and the Advisory Council of the College worry. Though the President and the Dean have been great supporters of the Africa semesters, it's the administration's job to anticipate the big picture, possible liability. Did the professor use good judgment? Lawsuits, ruinous financial settlements, and damaging publicity, I divert thoughts of what if, knowing how easily they can overwhelm and paralyze. Two days later, 
Our safari is a welcome respite from the city. Happy to be relieved of driving duties for a few days, Gavin parks the Wazungu whale, and we divide into three pop-top Toyota Land Cruisers. Elephant, zebra, giraffe, cheetah, rhino, and gazelle, these are the hooks for bringing students to East Africa. The word safari conjures up images from the Discovery Channel and National Geographic. Spirits are high. I'm fairly certain that if I promoted the semester by country names such as Malawi, Botswana, Namibia, or Zambia, I'd have few applications, because for most Americans, these names do not evoke even a click of recognition. Perhaps in world history surveys, Africa gets mentioned as the continent explored by Vasco da Gama, or ancient Egypt, which most people don't even associate with Africa, is described as the site of the pyramids. Television images of the wars, rebellions, ravages of AIDS, and the wildlife become nearly the only information. For the present, the game watch is everything. Luke and Sean in my vehicle are particularly keen-eyed. Simultaneously, they signal Isaac, our driver and guide, to stop. A cheetah, Luke says. Over there. He points under some green bushes about 200 yards away. I can't see anything, even with binoculars. In fact, most of my sightings turn out to be tree stumps. <laughs> but, but Isaac sees and smiles. Finding a cheetah is rare luck. Never a guarantee on a safari. Isaac is the best guide I've had in my five excursions to the Maasai Mara. He's profoundly knowledgeable about history, habitat, zoology, and ornithology, and his English is good. I've had other guides with great knowledge, but few communication skills. Isaac's family lives three and a half hours northwest of Nairobi, and he rarely gets home, but I think at least he has a good job. We pull quietly closer to the bush, Isaac says. Actually, this is not a cheetah, though it looks like a cheetah. You sighted something even rarer. He turns around in his seat, beaming with admiration for Luke and Sean. This is a serval cat, he says. They're common, but not usually seen during the day. They are nocturnal and like to be near the water. He points to a creek near the bushes. They're smaller and longer than the cheetah. On the second day, we do see a cheetah with three cubs, gnawing on a Thompson's gazelle. This is an excellent sighting. We pull close enough for good photos. Luke has a fine telephoto lens and takes nearly a whole roll of film, but he says seeing the serval is more exciting. Eventually, on our last afternoon, I ask Isaac more about his life and job. I wonder why he doesn't bring his family to Nairobi. He tells me there's not enough money, that he shares one room with two other drivers, and sends money home each month. I ask him if he likes his work, and he shakes his head. If I tell you, I'll lose my job, he says. I promise him confidence. The truth is, we get no pay at all. We can eat safari meals with the travelers, but we get nothing, nothing. I figure the pay is low, but I'm shocked. How is it possible? You guides are the heart of the safari. You're the ones who make it wonderful, not the owners of the vehicles. We get the tips, and even these we split. Backpackers rarely tip for services. I feel sick, although I always tip for the group and pass a hat for students to add more. I'm pleased when my students are generous, and they usually are, but I feel helpless. Obviously, I cannot break Isaac's trust and complain to the owners. Boycotting the company is even harder on the guides. He tells me something else that shocks me. The company tells us we should make some money by cheating. They say we should lie to the park's officials at the gate about how many clients are actually in the van. In this way, a guide can pocket some of the park fees. I can't believe it. It's terrible, and it's true, he shakes his head. And when we cheat, and we've all done it out of desperation, we're terrified of getting caught. If we do, we'll lose our jobs face the police, and maybe worse than that. I'm incredulous and nearly speechless. I can shake my own head and repeat, that's horrible. He says, you know, when we drivers pass each other and talk, it's about warnings, whether or not the park police are on patrol. At this point, I laugh and tell Isaac, I'd always wondered what the drivers talked about so earnestly when they meet on the roads. I guessed it was about animals and whether or not there were lions nearby or a recent kill. 
but now I know and feel anger about the way the companies abuse their employees. I also don't know how I can help. Like most of the other guides, Isaac hopes to find financing to buy his own vehicle so as not to depend on one company for work. But this is not easy. In Africa, buying anything means you must have the full amount in cash. Credit doesn't exist, even for a house. I'm always explaining the American way of buying, indicating the downsides of debt. But for people who can never amass sums even to buy small appliances, our system seems preferable. Several Maasai men operate our camp. Some cook. Others keep fire all night and guard for animals. Most have not gone to government or mission schools and speak neither English nor Swahili. They, have friendly and protect they are friendly and protective and communicate the ne necessary information by helping us make camp, putting out the toilet and shower. There are tents with thatch teepee-like frames and an open covered patio with two long tables and chairs for our meals. Two shacks have outhouse toilets, as well as a stall with a pipe roped to the roof for shower water. A wood stove heats the water, and water runs through a spigot for washing. We carry our own bottled water for drinking. At night after dinner, we sit around a campfire in a semicircle on rough benches wrapped in blankets or congas, colored African cloth. The stars are bright, and without any other light except the fire, they seem close. They seem oh, just overhead. The first time I saw stars like this in the Mara, I felt almost assaulted. The stars had closed in on me in a way that reminded me of snorkeling in Hawaii, with thousands of fish surrounding and frightening me. The Maasai men dance around the fire, entertainment for which we each contribute 200 Kenyan shillings, about $2.50. The dancers wear their characteristic red cloth wrapped around their waist and shoulder and carry their clubs. They chant and hum and move in a circle around the fire, skipping, hesitating slightly on the back foot for rhythm, pounding their, pounding their clubs into the ground to mark the beat. The circle movement and humming continue until the dancers make 10 or 15 revolutions. <clears throat> then they form a line and each dancer comes forward one by one, high jumping in place while the others continue humming and pounding their clubs in rhythm. The jumps are amazing, three to four feet straight up. The jumpers enjoy showing off their best high jumps to us and to each other. When each one has done two turns, they begin the circle runs again. Then they turn out from the circle in a line and run off into the dark. In the Maasai village that we visit at the end of the second day of game watching, the women also dance. They arrive single file, singing. They wear anklets and bracelets with bells that tingle, and one of them beats a small drum. They turn and face us, singing and dancing in a forward and backward movement, maintaining the line. One of them approaches our group and takes Sonia's hand to join them. We look at each other and laugh, because whenever there's dancing, Sonia seems to be the one among us who's chosen first. None of us can explain this coincidence, since Sonia seems to project no overt body language or interest in the music, she does like to dance, and perhaps this is mysteriously communicated and understood. After a while, a few of others of our group join in. The men demonstrate how they create fire without matches by rubbing dry sticks. We go inside various huts and sit on the floor. These are single windowless rooms, smoky with a cooking fire and dark. There are sleeping mats and a few pots hung on the walls. The villagers own and graze their own cattle. They build thatch fences around their enclave to protect the huts and cattle from the predators. Our safari, fee, our safari fees include a gift to the villagers for, for inviting us inside and permission to take photos. I dislike the tourist role, but this money is their only source of cash besides the sale of jewelry and carvings. The government allows the Maasai to graze in the Mara, a mere concession to people who have roamed this land for a thousand years. Sonia keeps a list of animals seen from her vehicle, lion, cheetah, elephant, zebra, giraffe, wildebeest, impala, gazelle, hippo, warthog, topi, dick dick, hartebeest, cape buffalo. She also writes many birds. My list also has eagle, ostrich, peacock, buzzard, bustard, stork, 
egret, guinea fowl, and heron. I note that there are many birds whose names I don't write down. I like the lilac-breasted roller for the color, the lilac chest, as well as the beautiful electric blue wings, and the secretary bird for humor. The secretary's tall, stork-like, with a crest of quill-like feathers on the back of its head. It walks with a high step and wears pink knee highs. The students prefer the larger game, especially the big five, elephant, buffalo, lion, cheetah, and leopard. I remember getting teased on a safari in 94 because I fixed my binoculars on a dung beetle for nearly 20 minutes. <laughs> I was mesmerized with its work. A three-quarter inch insect rolling a ball of dung the size of a grapefruit across the road. My guide told me that the dung beetle buries itself in the ball during the summer and feeds as well as it and lays its eggs in the dung. Later in the 2002 semester, when we camp at the Kalahari Bushbreaks Hostel on the border of Namibia and Botswana, the owner describes a safari to see the big 500 bugs at the Kalahari. He uses an illustration of the dung beetle pushing a ball with its back legs on his brochure. Had we stayed another day, I would have signed up. The end of the safari, <laughs> the end of the safari marks the first of the high profile aspects of being in Africa. While the experience is fresh, Everyone is buzzing with excitement back at the Nairobi hostel, comparing sightings, wondering about the quality of their photos, looking at the digital images on Malia's camera, and planning the next two days in Nairobi, after which we'll take off for the Swahili island of Lamu on the east coast. Luke says he'll need two days to do laundry, although some of us wonder why, since he seems to wear the same blue tank top sh shirt every day. <laughs> The safari definitely weighs in on the positive side of experiences in Kenya. But for, the most, for most of the students, only retrospect will modify the first negative impressions of Nairobi. Big cities are never Sean's preference, although he says he would definitely go back to Kenya, even Nairobi. I'm guessing that everyone will eventually reevaluate their Nairobi impressions when they analyze what it means to live in and visit Africa. In the end, they'll different, differentiate their experiences from those of the wealthy tourists who helicopter to expensive game parks and in lodges in order to avoid the dangers and annoyances of urban Africa. And that ends chapter five.